What's happening YouTube? Cowboy here and welcome to the first build video of many for Dragon Age Inquisition. So of course first up we're going to take a look at Double Dagger Rogue, the class I decided to do the walkthrough with. Now Double Dagger Rogue has extremely high damage burst potential, it has very high DPS and a lot of mobility. Conversely you have limited AOE options. Uh, your CC with this particular build at least isn't very high at all and you do lack tank ability. And this is part of the reason why I feel that this game is going to be great to do build videos on. You know, just using Rogue as an example, you can build it as a ranged character, a close range character, a support based character, a pure burst character. So the game really kind of gives itself to, to build videos. And I think I'm going to have a lot of fun putting these out for you guys and showing you some different ways to play. But just to give you an idea of how this is going to go down since this is the first one, we're going to show you a full build for a level 20 uh, dual wield assassin stealth based rogue additionally we're going to show you how to level up moving towards level 10 how to respec into your specialization when you hit level 10 we're going to go into gear including both weapon and armor and accessory choices and then lastly we're going to show you both solo and group combat to show you how the rogue plays so to start off with the character record of course first up we have the double daggers tree and your first two basic moves you're going to get are going to be flank attack and twin fangs now, along with those, the other skills you're going to want to pick up very early is going to be Stealth. And Stealth is going to be the absolute staple of this build. If you're playing a Rogue and you don't have Stealth, you're doing it wrong, in my opinion. Rogues are, are built for Stealth. We're meant to do it from behind, baby. That's how it works. So, you know, just starting out Rogue, what I would suggest doing for your build would be, obviously, three points between Flank Attack, Twin Flangs, and Stealth. Moving into the fourth point, we want Dance of Death. 5 with Sneak Attack, 6 with Death Blow, 7 with Thrill of Victory. Moving over into the Sabotage Tree, we'll have 8 with Caltrops, 9 with Looked Like It Hurt, and then 10 with Cheap Shot. Now let's go into why we picked what we did while we're leveling up. So first up we of course have Flank Attack, and Flank Attack is an excellent move for mobility and for the utility of it. You know, it's 400% weapon damage in total. It's a relatively low cooldown in 8 seconds, and it's going to give us the positioning we need to maximize our damage. Rogue is going to always perform the best when it's either behind or flanking its target, which means on the sides, and that's what we need. We need to be flanking to really maximize what we're able to do, and, you know, flank attack does exactly that. It gets us where we need to be. Uh, Twin Fangs is a great move, especially while you're leveling up. ton of burst potential. If you hit the target from behind or in a flanking position, you of course get bonus damage and knock them down as well, making it a great utility skill while you're leveling up. But unfortunately, it does get outclassed later on by Death Blow, which you can see is why it's no longer on our bar. Moving down, we have Dance of Death. 50 stamina restored on kill. It's just a fantastic passive and a great way to progress. And then Sneak Attack. Anything that is a back or flank attack gets a huge boost to the critical hit chance. This is pretty much a staple as well if you're going to play Rogue. This is, this is what's going to let us sit on those big targets while they're being tanked and just tear through them. So moving down from there, we have Death Blow. And the thing about Death Blow is the tooltip's a little bit tricky. The important thing to remember here is the and then again against a wounded foe. So basically, we're getting 300% weapon damage at base with Death Blow. If we have Thrill Victory, make that 400% in total. And then we're getting an extra 3% for each 1% missing health. So in general, you're going to use Death Blow on a target that's at 50% because that's the health threshold. So at 50%, you know, with 3% missing and the Thrill of Victory bonus and the base damage, we're looking at 550% weapon damage and then a second hit for another 550% weapon damage, making this one of our hardest hitting abilities. And not only that, but by having Thrill of Victory, we're going to kill the target, making so there's no cooldown on Death Blow. And of course, one thing that's quite convenient, you might notice Death Blow costs 50 stamina. He regains stamina with every kill, regaining back 50, making it so that we can go from target to target, and just Death Blow to Death Blow. Moving out of that tree, we of course have stealth, even if it's just basic stealth at this point, because you're going to want it. Stealth is going to give you mobility around the battlefield, it's going to give you positioning, you can get out of bad situations, you can get right where you need to be, you have to have stealth. As for sabotage, we're going to have caltraps early on, and I don't use it in the late game, but early on it helps just to slow enemies down, control the battle a little bit more, but we're picking that up more to work our way down towards the passives. It looked like it hurt, giving us 10 stamina restored on critical hits, especially when we're flanking and we have that high critical hit chance. 
is going to ensure we have almost 100% uptime on all of our abilities and that we're never too low on stamina to pull them off. And at the same time, Cheap Shot, giving us Sundering every time we crit, is just going to be extra DPS. For those that aren't aware, Sundering basically counts as 20% armor penetration on your targets. So of course at level 10 you unlock a specialization and everything just kind of changes around. So we ended up going down the assassin tree, which in my opinion is absolutely brutal. I think Tempest is a lot of fun as well. I haven't played with the third tree. I don't even remember what the hell it's called. It's like Engineer or, or some shit. I don't know. I don't make trap rogues. I make rogues that kill stuff. But looking into assassin and what makes it so brutal. First up, Hidden Blades. Three hits, 300% weapon damage. Always get overkill on this. An extra three hits, giving us a total of 1,800 weapon damage. That's basically instant as well making it one of the single target highest bursting abilities in the entirety of the game. Awesome, awesome skill. Moving down, I was never here. Every time we kill a target, we slip back into stealth. That's pretty sexy in my opinion, because we're getting a, a damage bonus coming out of stealth. And additionally, with the next perk, Knife in the Shadows, we're getting a guaranteed critical hit every time we come out of stealth, making it all the more just, uh, it just like piles sexy on top of sexy. I love it. And then lastly, of course, we have Mark of Death, which is the highest damaging move in the entire game when used correctly. Now, the way Mark of Death works is how it says it stores damage. Basically, if we put Mark up, we do Hidden Blades for 1,500. Let's say the Warrior hits an Earthshaking Strike for 500, and then uh, Vivian drops a Blizzard out that happens to do 1,000 damage to a single target. Just stick with me here. I know that would not happen. Alright, so that's 3,000 damage total. If we detonate Mark at that point, we're not only going to do 3,000, we're going to do like 3,200 because we're going to have that bonus damage coming out as well. And that's a, an important thing to note with Mark is that as you can see, it says you can mainly trigger the Mark early for bonus damage. I would suggest always triggering the Mark early for the bonus damage because in my experience, if you let Mark just run out, the burst does seem to be a little bit lower, so I don't know how much the bonus exactly is. I haven't seen any numbers on it, but I would suggest always doing it early for the bonus damage. But basically, you know, when we put Mark up, any and all damage that goes on the target, as long as we detonate that Mark after that damage has been done, is going to be reapplied. And you can do some really, really disgusting combinations with this. If you've watched the walkthrough, one thing you might have seen me do is I put Mark up on a target, and then I had Sarah use Thousand Cuts, and then I detonate a Mark, and it instantly killed a giant. Like, it just went Thousand Cuts to dead. It was awesome. But, you know, obviously when you hit level 10 and you respect to this, how are you going to level up? Where do you want to go with your skills? So, starting from level 10 and respecting 1.2.3.4.5 six seven eight nine ten and at this point you'd hope to have at least one amulet of power and that's of course going to be stealth but we're looking at building up towards level 20 so obviously you'll have all this stuff already you know you'll start to pick back up your stuff in uh in in the sabotage tree but now that we have the points in assassin this is where the subterfuge tree really begins to shine so almost as soon as possible, I would pick up Lost in the Shadows, which makes it so stealth is now instant, it removes all debilitating effects, and we can pass through enemies without being detected. And this is huge, because if we're on fire, if we're chilled, whatever the case is, we pop stealth and boom, it's gone. Which is awesome, and also it's instant cast, which is just makes it you know even better than before. Uh, moving down from there, we have Evasion which isn't the best passive in my opinion, but it is important to go down this side of the tree, so we are going to pick it up. We get Evade, which is an excellent mobility skill. As you can see, I have it on the left trigger button, similar to Flank Attack. You know, they're both my mobility skills over there. And Evade is great because you can dodge knights that are charging you, you can dodge Dragon Breath, you can dodge pretty much anything with Evade, making it a fantastic mobility skill, and it has a very low cooldown, making it great to use. We, of course, have Ambush, giving us 50% armor penetration coming out of stealth. And if you remember, every time we kill an enemy, we're able to go back into stealth and get a guaranteed critical hit. So now we're looking at pretty much a static 50% armor pen on all those opening crits out of stealth. And then finally, we have Shatter Strike, the last move that finds a place on our bar. With 400% weapon damage, an extra 200 if we're in stealth. And more importantly, the upgrade, which gives us cooldown reduction and cost reduction on the ability 
which is awesome because this is going to give us more uptime overall on all of our abilities, meaning more hidden blades, more mark of deaths, more re-entering stealth, and more burst altogether. So looking at this as a level 20 build, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and by 20, you should have at least two marks, so these should be your, your amulets of power. Now, obviously, that's not the order. You're going to want to get the assassin skills and the dagger skills first, and then from there, start to work your way down into subterfuge, because your stealth is really going to benefit after you have the assassin perks. Moving forward from that point, I'd suggest picking up first blood over in the archery tree, just because on all of our opening abilities from stealth, while we have that crit, we're getting an extra 15% damage bonus. Um, there's some other passives laying around you could get. Personally, I'm not a giant fan of Throw Cutter because at 50% health, it's only 10% extra damage. But if you have points to spend and you don't know where to go, you might as well. And I kind of felt the same way about gaps in the armor. Just because we already have the 50% bonus coming out of health, or coming out of stealth, excuse me. And on top of that, our rings are going to give us some more penetration. And our crits are going to give us sundering. So it's not necessary, but as you begin to level past 20, I would work down this way. Now... In terms of stuff like Knockout Bomb and Comatose, and um, you know, over here we got Knockout Powder and Deep Sleep. Personally, I'm not a giant fan of sleep. I find that even with the upgrades, enemies don't stay asleep long enough for me to really get the DPS potential that I could out of an ability like this. And I mean, even with Mercy Killing giving guaranteed critical hits, you know, that, that's cool and all, but with our base critical hit chance already, and then the critical hit chance that we have from sneak attack, we're looking at about 66-70% crit chance as it is. So, you know, the extra 30% is like, yeah, whoopity do, but you know, I'm already critting so much, and I already have 100% coming out of stealth, which is when my big burst moves are going to happen. So, real quick, just to go into why we didn't pick some of the other skills, Bloody Prey, useless. Never get it. And the big thing to note here is that Bloody Prey is numerically based, not percentage based, making it an absolutely terrible passive to have. You know, especially as you move towards the late game, enemies are never going to have health that's lower than you. Like, think about the dragons. They have thousands upon thousands of health. So this is basically never coming into effect. Um, Unforgiving Chain, also terrible passive. 1% critical hit chance that actually falls off when we attack. There was something very similar to this in Diablo as well. And, and there, it was also terrible. Because fact of the matter is, once you get a crit chance above about 50%, the usefulness of this is just none. It, it's gone. On the other hand, Spinning Blades with Never Ending Spin, pretty awesome ability. Gives us some AoE capacity, also gives us a good chance to, to proc our chance on hit effects. Unfortunately, we have to go through two terrible passives to get it, and we'd have to replace one of the abilities on our loadout to get it as well, which unfortunately, in my opinion, makes it not worth it at the end of the day. Um, as for over here, I know a lot of people are, are very adamant about poison weapons. Honestly, I think it's lackluster. I feel that without getting the Infected Wounds perk and the Fighting Dirty perk and the Explosive Toxin perk, that your poison weapons just aren't effective enough to justify a spot on my bar. And in my opinion, I'm not going to pick up four different points for one ability. Just not happening, you know? Um, and I think that pretty much covers all of the, the skills. So, um, obviously, you know, if you have extra points, go for focus teamwork. Nice little thing to get overall. But in general, that's how you should aim to play. And so real quick, just to go into some of the synergies we're looking at here. <clears throat> obviously, you know, we have over in the assassin tree... Every time we kill something, we're going back into stealth. We have guaranteed crits coming from stealth. We have 50% armor penetration coming from stealth. We have Shadow Strike, which is a 600% damage from stealth. And additionally, it knocks the target down, making it so that that target is incapacitated for about two seconds while we just wail on it. It's also reducing all of our cooldowns. So all in all, this build focuses around really heavy stealth play. Um, of course, we also have the Skirmisher perk and Flank Attack, which makes it so our Flank Attack puts us in stealth, giving us just even more stealth and more critical hit bonuses to go off of. And all in all, this build focuses around staying in stealth the majority of the time. And when you're coming out of stealth, you're coming out to slaughter enemies outright. So hopping over into the inventory real fast, 
you can see we have a pair of dual crafted daggers and the easiest way to get these is through the perk in the forces tree for the the inquisition perk and you know we use dragon bone to get them up to 319 dps and then dragon leather for both uh the seven on cunning and dexterity which in term of uh, stat weight they're actually pretty close to being equal as a rogue um, as for our, our grip bonus, we decided to double stack and get flanking damage bonus, which based on current theory crafting results, flanking damage pretty much outclasses any other thing you could put on rogue daggers, including armor penetration. And then of course for our masterwork, we went for a 10% chance to use hidden blades on hit with the added four hits. Now the hidden blades on hit, in my opinion, is hands down probably the best masterwork effect for a rogue. It is a relatively late game effect, and it is kind of hard to find. I actually ended up just finding it before this video, and it was the one thing that I was waiting on to do the video. But you can find it on Fade Touched Velveteen, Fade Touched Ring Velvet, and Fade Touched Plush Fuchsian Velvet, or Fustian, or however the hell you're supposed to say it. But it's it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, you guys saw the, the Hidden Blades tooltip earlier. You see how much damage it can do. So now we just have a 10% chance on swing with the fastest swinging weapons in the game to proc it again. That's just sexy in my opinion. Uh, moving down from there into armor, I would suggest going for the on-hit gain guard bonus. This is actually what I had on my daggers before I found the hidden blade masterwork materials. And on-hit guard is useful because it's going to give you just a little bit more survivability, which is nice because even though we're not a class that plays around you know, trying to tank enemies and trying to fight stuff face-to-face, Having a bar of guard is the difference between getting one shot and not getting one shot. And an important thing to note is that it's not god tier OP. You know, a, a full bar of guard on a rogue isn't the equivalent of a full bar of guard on a warrior. We don't have the same guard bonuses, but it will help with some mitigation, and it very easily can be the difference between life and death. Lastly, going down to accessories. Um, in general, I would suggest going for whatever the best choices you have available. If you have a really good flanking damage ring, go for that. I obviously have the uh, Sapur Ring of Bleeding right now, and then a, uh, a token of the Pack Master as well, which adds additional bleed on hit. And there's some reports that they're broken, but I, I feel like the bleeds are still working, so for the time being, I'm going to keep using them. But having a Ring of Armor Penetration is also a good choice. Obviously, we have 50 opening. We get an extra 20 from Sundering our enemy. We have another 20 coming in here, so that puts us at 90% Armor Pen, coming out of stealth on our targets. And then I have a belt of fire resistance because I hate getting torched by dragons. But in general, if you have purple or blues, I'd suggest them. Uh, also, as just a note, from my understanding, a lot of the ability rings are somewhat bugged at the moment. And what I mean by that is like the Twin Fangs ability ring, for example, doesn't take into account the bonus damage of the additional perk. And some rings aren't really boosting damage at all on their abilities. So in general, despite using it for, for most of the walkthrough, um, the word on the street at least, is to avoid those for the time being. And obviously this may change in the future, it may be patched, so you know, don't be afraid to do a little googling, search the, the forums, find out if they're, they're more effective at that point, because they could be. I mean, 30% damage boost is huge on a move, but only if the ring is, is working as intended and giving a true 30% boost to that ability. So, all in all, that covers all the different builds, or excuse me, the, the build for the rogue, how to how to level it up, you know, type of gear you're going to use. Uh, what we're going to do now, I'm going to hunt down some baddies. I'm going to show you how to how to play solo because, you know, sometimes the whole party dies. It's, it's shitty when it happens, but it does happen. And then we're going to wrap things up with crapping all over a couple rifts. All right, guys, so right up ahead, I have found basically a camp full of baddies, including a boss-style baddie and um, got in a brief skirmish with them, and then they all kind of retreated to hide around the big dude, and things went south, but we're going to try and solo this. Rogues are not built for solo. We are excellent in teams. We're not made to solo, and uh, just for the record, we of course are playing on Nightmare, so I suppose this will be a true test of what the rogue can actually do. So our main opener should be Mark Stealth Hidden Blades. That's what we're going to aim for right here. Get it right on a uh, good old commander guy. So we got Mark. We stealth, Hidden Blades goes out, detonate the mark, huge amounts of burst right there, as you can see, almost killing the, the captain dude outright. We're going to hit this veteran, re-stealth, looking for a good opportunity to take the big man down. This is what they did before, they all retreated into a big
big little circle jerk over here. Oh no, that is not enough to knock him down. So we're going right back into stealth. We'll let him just, we'll let that, we'll let that armor guard fall on off. So that we're going to take down one of the smaller guys. This was really a bad situation to, I don't know, they're all surrounding him. This is not how I wanted to showcase Rogue, but you got to work with what you got, right? Back into stealth. Death blow. Back into stealth. Is your guard down yet? Is he gonna make me fight through that whole guard? He is. What a little shit. Procs going up. Death blow. And we're gone again. I don't know who Malifant is, but we're not really here to fuck with him. Enjoy a stealth hidden blade. Oh shit. We missed our target there. And obviously, you know, this is this is not how Rogue is intended to be played. You're supposed to be in a group. Ideally, you're going to have a warrior up front that's going to be tanking your target, which will allow you to get in tons and tons of DPS through the flank. And that's that's obviously the ideal way for this to work. But, you know, we're, we're working with what we got available. And we had available involved a camp full of baddies. Commander is down. These guys really think they're gonna kill me. See, this is the great thing too as a rogue. Like, and given you're usually just active combat, and the the warrior is gonna sit there and tank shit for you, so you don't have to worry about getting hit. But you know, shit hits the fan, you can jump back in stealth and just wait things out. You can res teammates in stealth. You can heal and re stealth. And you know, there's there's not many classes that are gonna just walk in and, and solo an encampment full of guys like that. Completely solo on Nightmare. Ooh, look at that. What a nice toy. Ooh, a Night Enchanter Greatsword, too. I'm finding all kinds of goodies for my party. They're going to be so happy to see me again. So it's pretty obvious by this point that Rogue has the potential to do a ton of damage, even when it's by itself. But what about when we're in a party? You know, Dragon Age is meant to be played with a party of four, so... Let's show you how Rogue works in a party dynamic. Now, in general, I would suggest going towards the back of the battleground looking to pick off key enemies, like in this case, the Despair Demon is my top priority every single time. Uh, but in general, mages, archers, anything that's going to sit in the back and cause trouble for the rest of the party is stuff that I'm going to run up and I'm going to kill before it can give anybody trouble at all. So we're picking off the Wraith right now. And while you do have a ton of, of DPS potential and uptime, I feel that going around and picking off those weaker targets because you have the speed to do so, overall makes things a lot easier for your party. Because I can pick off these weak targets a lot faster than anyone else in the party can. And by doing that, it basically enables my party to focus their efforts on tanking the bigger stuff while I work on just working down the little things. He did. Pop the mark. So even if we're not opening, we can still get a, a ton of damage into something like a Despair Demon. So we now have it in death blow range. And of course this prick's going to put up a barrier. Oh, and Vivian on the spell, it goes down. That demon's dead. We, of course, have stealth back up. So we're going to hop back in, head over here, and take out these wraiths. Another death blow to take one out. A little low on stamina at the moment, but oh, not looking to blow the rift. We're looking to just slaughter these demons. It looks like the party might have cleaned those two up already. Nice. But you see, so right there, you know, the party focused, all three of them were basically focused on the, the two rage demons, and in the meantime, we went around 
dispatched a couple wraiths, dispatched the despair demon, and whatever has your scattered mind conjured now. By picking off all those those smaller, weaker enemies that are spread all over the battlefield, we're effectively enabling our team to, to take out the big dogs that are actually a threat. And in my opinion, Rogue is is the best class to do that. I mean an archer ideally is gonna be what's gonna be picking off that stuff in the background, but you know, I'm not gonna control the Sarah AI to do all that when I have the kind of burst potential I already have as a dagger rogue. So either way guys, if you take away anything from this video, it's that Rogue is a extremely high damaging class you have a ton of burst potential you have a ton of dps uptime very high crit chance it's a ton of fun to play and it has a very strong focus on stealth and hopefully you end up trying out rogue and, and learning to love it as much as i do so thanks for coming by in terms of what build video will be next uh, it'll be either a archer based rogue or a two-handed warrior um, mainly d depending on which route i want to go i mean i could use just bull for the video or i could use the drunk through character for the video more than likely i'll just end up using the characters on this playthrough since they're all getting around the appropriate levels but either way make sure to stay tuned for more dragon age inquisition builds and we'll see you guys next time